Oh, is it? Because I'm getting an error yeah. message. Yep, so we are live. Steve says we are live. We're going to go with we are live. Uh, guys, you know how it rolls around here. Um, we're here one minute and gone the next. If Lisa clicks the wrong button, and I was getting ready to hit another button, but um, Steve says we're live. So I'm going to ignore the error message from Facebook. Rona's giving me thumbs up. Um, anyway, you know, we always give a couple seconds for them to share from one social media to the next social media and obviously give time for more people to pop on. But just as a reminder, this is Quilt Babble Live with Lisa and Rona. It is season three and episode one. I cannot even believe it, Rona. Let's give <laughs> ourselves a whoop, whoop. <laughs> so we thought it would be so appropriate for our first episode on season three to talk about a quilt journey from start to finish. And of course, who other than our special guest, Miss Teresa Justice, to be here with us tonight. As in my eyes, she is just the queen when it comes to a major quilting journey. And she makes it look so easy with her Years and years of knowledge in quilting and her organizational skills and all that stuff. And Teresa, thank you for joining Rona and I tonight. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited about it. I love to talk quilts. I can I, talk quilts for a long time. So <laughs> I forgot to wear my queen crown. So <laughs> absolutely. So tell everybody where you're located, how many years you've been quilting. A little bit about yourself in regards to the quilting world for those that may not know Teresa Justice. Gosh. Okay, I live in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and um, I've been quilting more in depthly since in the nineties. I had to, I had started sooner than that, but raising my kids and all, I didn't really have the time to devote to it, and I got really into it in the nineteen nineties, and I formed a quilt club because I didn't know any other quilters. So we formed our little quilt club and I developed a group of friends that I enjoy quilting with. And so from there, you just move on into it. I have learned over the years that when I first started, I wanted to make as many quilts as I could and get as many out as quick as I could. And But as I've gotten older, I've learned I really enjoy handwork, applique, English paper piecing, embroidery, hand quilting, all that. And I just take my time and enjoy making the quilt and not worry so much about hurrying up to get it over with. So I would suggest that to all quilters. Just enjoy what you do. You know, enjoy the journey. Don't worry about making when you're going to get it done or even if you're going to get it done. <laughs> you know, and that's so true because like so many of us, in fact, the quilt that I'm literally working on, you can't see it, but my desk has cut pieces all over it. Um, but we're so worried about deadlines, like we got to get this quilt for a Christmas gift or a birthday gift or whatever. And then sometimes the the enjoyment of the actual piecing and all that kind of gets lost sometimes. So that's really good advice. Absolutely. It's a lot of stress on you. You know, you stress over it instead of enjoying it. So, yeah. Well, Teresa left out a few little key parts about her quilting journey. So Teresa has... Uh, been a quilt instructor many times over. She also, her and one of her good friends, Darlene, if I remember correctly, um, co-authored a book, Introduction to English Paper Piecing. Right, Teresa? That's correct, yes. See, she didn't <laughs> want to toot her own horn, but I'm going to toot it for her because I want to tell you, I do look up to this woman so so much and she has inspired me to try things um like this amazing quilt behind her that we will eventually get into but before we get into truly talking about a quilt journey rona i just want to say thank you for being my cohort in crime here this journey with quilt babble is fabulous yeah i i i a thousand percent agree who knew three years ago that we'd still be doing this because we just started it for fun because we like to talk about quilts and we figured other people did too. And so, yeah, and, and not just with this, but with our friendship and, and everything, it's, it's been an amazing journey and I can't wait for more. 
Absolutely. I can't wait for more either. So you guys know how you can find me for the most part, sewendipitous.com, sewendipitous on Facebook. It is the local quilt shop here in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Rona, how can these fabulous people keep? Oh, no. <laughs> I think, so those those of you that don't know, uh, Lisa is on location. And so that's the second time that she's frozen. So I think she was asking about where people can find me. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's obviously I'm here on Facebook and Instagram and the YouTube channel and my website, RonaTheRibbiter.com, which is all things quilting related travel, including tours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> throw that out there. Teresa, are you still actively, um, I know you teach at my shop some, but are you still actively teaching for some of the other places or have you kind of retired and only saving it for yours truly? Yeah, I, I pretty much retired from that. I did some teaching for the uh, American Quilter Society and for the um, Quilters of South Carolina. I've, um, I've, for a while there, I traveled among various guilds in South Carolina and once up in North Carolina doing presentations and workshops and all that. But, you know, once I retired from work, I really didn't want to work anymore. And that's teaching. I admire women who travel and teach and do all these things because it did a lot of work and it just takes away from my quilting time. So I don't do much of it anymore. <laughs> That's that's the blessing of being retired. Now, she said the ladies that travel and teach. I'm going to give a plug just because there is a lot of men out there teaching quilting and stuff now. Mm -hmm. And we were very fortunate to recently have Scott Flanagan with Fourth and Main Designs, you know, in So Indipitous. And I'm telling you, we joked this weekend or this week. I don't even know what day it is because like Rona says, I'm in Utah right now with Handy Quilter. But before I left Rona, uh, Scott and I were joking. Uh, I said, you know, Rona is the traveling quilter. However, I'm thinking he might be on the road a little more than you come 2025. Uh, that's possible. Oh, but I, I still, I'm still the, the, the queen bee as it were, because I travel farther and that counts. <laughs> you do, you do travel further. And guys, if you're watching this, definitely stay tuned to the end. Cause I'm sure Rona has all things travel quilting related to blab about for sure. So Teresa, let's dive in. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what she was First wanting me to talk about. You froze again. <laughs> uh oh. Did she freeze again? Am I here? Yeah, you are now. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. I was saying, Teresa, so to start a quilting journey, I'm assuming, and please correct me because you're the 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 lead here. Is the first thing you do for your quilt journey is choose a pattern? Well, yes, yeah, sort of. I um, I usually always want to have a big quilt in process, but then I'll do a lot of smaller things, you know, wall hangings, table runners, things like that, or work with my friends on some projects they're doing. But um, like... Right now, it seems like every time I get ready to do a larger quilt project, it's always one that Katrina Hangemichael designed. And um, I, I discovered her about, I don't know, about three years ago, I think. I had finished up a um, grandmother's flower garden, and I just didn't know what to do with myself. You know, have, are y'all like that? You finish a big project and it's like, oh no, I don't have that to work on. So yeah. I got to looking on and I found a quilt she had done called Pemberley and I was sold and I had to do that one. And so, yeah, I get the pattern and I'll and I'll read through the pattern real closely and, and I kind of start thinking about the colors or the fabrics I want to use. And then... Um, what I, I do, and Lisa, you've seen me carry this around. I thought I had it right here with me. My notebook, my design notebook. And um, can I pull that picture up and show it? Do you, 
You can do whatever you like. You're the special guest. It's all about you tonight, Teresa. Why, Teresa, okay. that up when she's talking a big project, the quilt behind her, well, there's the picture of it. As you guys can see, that is not a get it done in a weekend quilt by no means. No. <laughs> not at all. Okay, let me make it my little, I just picked out a few little pictures. This is a notebook that Lisa sees me carrying around her shop a lot. Anytime I'm going to make a quilt, the first thing I want to do is read the pattern and I put it in this notebook. And then I carry that with me so I can see the picture and look at the fabrics. And then I will start a fabric sheet. And guys, if you need a fabric sheet, we do have them under our free downloads on sewindividus.com under freebies at the top. It is a uh, fabric swatch sheet just like this. Yeah. And like in the case of this quilt that's showing now, these were the first three fabrics I picked. And that's pretty much what I had. And there's a fourth one with that. It's an orange color. And I, I didn't think I was going to use the orange. So it's not on there. And then the orange turned out to be one of my main colors. But I then I start adding complementary fabrics to it until I get enough that I think I probably have enough I can start on the quilt. And then I can I have to then decide what I'm going to use for the the main part. Like these are the birds. But I was, and they're kind of like the center of this quilt. And then I like to think about what my backing fabric will be. That makes a big difference. And then um, a lot of designers will tell you, and it makes perfectly good sense to me, when you're first starting a quilt, if it has a border, pick out your border fabric. And then that will then lead you to the colors that you want to use in your quilt. Well, I didn't do it that way. I picked out my other fabrics <laughs> and I was getting close to the point I had to really think about this border and I was in Lisa's shop one day and this fabric had just come in. Do you remember that, Lisa? And I do. I don't even think you had put it on the shelf yet. No. And I said, I got it. I want that one. And I took it back and I, fortunately I had my center block with me and I went and got Lisa and I said, what do you think? Will this work? And you were very encouraging. So, and I, I really love this border. I think that was a good choice. So, and then, so I kind of patch things up just so I can refer to them when I'm thinking about doing some of the applique. I can go back to the sheets, the colors I picked. I don't have to pull out this big fabric box. I've got all my fabrics there that I can use to make my selections. And I try to do this before I even start the quilt. I, I want to get my fabrics together and, and, and think about how I'm going to use them and then um, and then walk around and have the fun of buying fabric. <laughs> I know. And Teresa, what is the name of the quilt behind you that we're looking at the fabric swatches for? This is the Delaford. Okay. On the Delaford, <laughs> do you have a picture of the designer's quilt? I do. I want to talk about this a second. This so, is Katrina. Yes. This, uh, and where is Katrina Hedge Michael located, Teresa? Well, I'm not sure of the town, but she's in Australia. <laughs> and I, you know, I love those Australian designers. I remember telling somebody, I just, I asked Katrina one time and he says, do you know Gail Pan? And she says, well, yeah, but I, but I forget that Australia is bigger than the United States, I think. And that would be like me saying, well, do you ever see someone of the designers that lives out in California? You know, <laughs> so, Exactly. Um, but I've often thought I'd love to go to Australia and just drive all over the country and see everybody. But this is Katrina and um Hadja Michael is her last name. And these this quilt, um, her quilts, she writes around the Jane Austen novel. She has a whole series where each quilt is named after a location in one of the Jane Austen books. And um, so this is hers that she did and that and I used as the reason okay. I wanted Teresa, sorry, Teresa, the reason I wanted Teresa to pull this picture up, and Rona and I have talked about this, I think probably any pattern designer, any quilt shop owner, uh, this conversation comes up because when Teresa first showed me the picture of this quilt, I'm expecting for Teresa to pull similar colors because a lot of times 
people have trouble going outside the box. So mm -hmm. when Teresa then pulled her fabric swatch, I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I love it. So now go back to your fabric swatches, Teresa, or the picture of your quilt to show okay. the difference. And I will point out these little corner stones she has right here. I have a t I don't think that I have ever made a quilt from somebody's pattern that I didn't change it slightly, you know, just to kind of tweak it a little bit. So I'll show you mine. Oh, let's see. Is this the full quilt? That's that's the center. Let me find the full one. But Here you can go. see the color difference, guys, and what I'm talking about. Rona, how much do we laugh that people can't get away from the colorway? Oh, yeah. But, you know, and that's it's funny because I have like with my patterns, I have some people that um, they have to make it exactly the same way that I did. And then there's other people that will just pull all kinds of unexpected fabrics. And and I love that. I love to see how people interpret, you know, the, the design. Because the whole I love thing. it. Yeah. yeah. And what I did with this one, um, those little twirly things that Katrina had, which were very pretty, they liked, looked nice, but I had this orange piece of fabric I needed to do something with. I had used the pink, purple, and teal. That's the three colors that was in that line that I bought, and I still had an orange, and I thought it just didn't seem to fit in until I started looking at my other fabrics, like in this with the birds. See how the orange in there and the golds? And the... So I modified and I just tweaked it a little. Instead of putting the little pinwheel looking things here, I just added another whatever these are to the corners. And that got my, my orange fabric in there, which was the one thing I really changed in this that of course, my colors are different from hers in the arrangement, but um, can I ask? I, a, can I ask a quick question about when you're pulling fabrics, like for especially a really big design like this that has a lot of different pieces and parts to it? Um, when you're pulling the fabrics, do you actually um, like? Do you have it in your mind that you know um, that you see it in your mind where the colors are going to go, or do you actually like play with them? like in a drawing or something like that how do you process where each of the fabrics are going to go good question well i just buy up as a lot of different fabrics that seem like they go with what i want to do <laughs> but then i do you know i knew when i found this fabric this this beautiful fabric right here i knew that was going to be my centerpiece i just knew it was so then i had to come up with my flowers and all so that they kind of would blend in with that so um, I do sort of know what I'm going to use for flowers and the vines and all that. But um, I guess what really set the tone for my quilt was these, the fabrics I used in this. And I try, I'm going to blow it up a little bit. I wanted those fabrics to be re repeated throughout my quilt. So I just ended up getting batiks and other fabrics that complemented these to go along with those colors. And if then whenever I, I get ready, to, I, I start to do some of the applique here. I just get out my fabric swatches and think, oh, okay, a pink flower here would look good. And then just kind of just started putting it together. If I remember, so you started, I'm sorry, wasn't you buying hmm. fabric a little throughout? You'd be like, oh, that will look good. And you kind of threw it in some last minutes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I did. So basically you start with whatever you want the main fabrics to be. And then, and then kind of uh, pull here and there as you go. <laughs> right. And if something just, I, it looks like I just don't have something that's going to look right there, then I'll go to Lisa's and find another piece of fabric. I usually that's have more of fabric thing. left <laughs> by the time I finish a quilt that I really needed to begin with, but then I can make more, so. Now, uh, once you've selected your fabric, Teresa, um, the question I feel like comes up in every babble and I already know your answer, but for those that admire your work, are you a pre-wash or a not a pre-wash? I am definitely a pre-washer. I, hmm. uh, I do that religiously. Even if I buy the little 
10 inch layer cakes. I'll zigzag the edges and watch them. I just, uh, and, and you know, I had some problems with this one. The, um, and it was basically these fabrics that I really love and there's probably, you uh, may can see some tinges of color. When I, when I do my applique, I actually draw on the fabric using the blue water soluble pen where the applique goes. Mm -hmm. And that way, I know if it doesn't fit exactly, I can just spritz that off and nobody will need to know it didn't fit exactly. But um, these fabrics, when whenever that water hit them, they just, the colors just bled. And this was after I had already washed them before I ever started using them and had put the dye catchers in there. And it still bled on my um, background fabric, which... I couldn't really wash it again then because I didn't have it quilted and bound and also I, I just kind of had to, to hold that off. But I'm a member of a um, Facebook group called Celebrate Hand Quilting and I went to there to see if anybody had had this problem and there was a whole discussion going on that, um, and I can't remember the lady's name, but she had a friend who worked with chemicals in fabric dyeing and all that and told her, you should take your fabrics before you ever cut them and wash them in retain, R-E-T-A-Y-N-E, and, and some dye catchers. And that somehow fixes the color. And then once you finish the quilt, you wash it again, but this time you use Synthropol and the dye catchers. And I did wash this one with the Synthropol after I had it finished. And it took just about every bit of the, the bleeding out. So that was that was good. But yeah, I do believe you should wash your fabric just to get um, any extra shrinkage or the color, the loose, what they call the loose colors that bleed easily. Try to get as much of that out as you can. So, I, yeah. knew, I knew her answer because we talk about this all the time for sure. And you all know I'm a lazy quilter and I do not pre-wash. Um, I do want to talk real quick about the fabrics that Teresa was talking about that once she spritz to get rid of her markings, bled. And I was telling Teresa this after the fact when she was telling me. So those are, you know, premium quilt uh, fabrics, but some of the companies are going to digital printing. And, you know, it's been happening for X amount of years. I can't even say how many years, but there is a learning process to that. And those inks are sitting on top of those fabrics versus our traditional type of, of quilting fabric. So I am finding that people are starting to pre-wash a little more, more with those digital prints. And those uh, beginning fabrics that Teresa loved was digital print. Yeah. And I did um, start from that point on. I did, let me blow this up a little bit so you can see it. All of my background, I quilted in a hexagons. Now, I've watched this quilt, so of course they puffed up a little bit, so you can't see them as closely. But I couldn't trace, I was scared to trace all those hexagons with the blue water soluble pen. So I started using the um, purple or pink air erasable pen. And man, yeah. those things worked really good. That it would last for about a day and a half, and I so I made sure whatever I marked, I didn't mark more than a day's work. And then um, within a couple, of days, it was gone. I didn't have to spritz it with water anymore. So That's I think this is great. We have to remind everybody that buys those: like, do not mark and know you're not going to touch that for two weeks because when you come back, be gone. Yeah, your markings are going to be gone, but those uh, purple air dry markers are fabulous for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I know you asked me what I do when I start doing this, but I also prep most of my pieces. Like these were all English paper piece. So I cut out all the paper pieces and had them sorted um, by sizes and all. And on all this applique, I cut out all those pieces for applique and had them in baggies marked. This is for this flower. This is for this flower. So by the time I finally started making the quilt, I had everything organized. And all I had to do was the pleasure of cutting the fabric and starting to sew it. So that's just kind of the way I approach the quilt. Hmm. So you mentioned applique in this quilt. You mentioned English paper piecing. 
Obviously, mm -hmm. there's traditional piecing because you have sashing and that type of stuff. Is there any other technique in here, Teresa, that we're not mentioning? Hmm. Other than your hand quilting. Yeah, the hand quilting. I don't think so. This, this I'm going to enlarge this a little bit. Adding this little gold trim was the part that really kind of frightened me when I looked at this pattern. I couldn't quite figure out how that would work. But um, Katrina had this, she gave you the pattern for what you see is the gold. And you didn't, you you cut that out in like a cardstock and you cover your, your paper with that. Um, just, and then you, you're going to press it, but I'm going to use that David Taylor technique of mixing starch with water and I starched it real good and it was just she only you only had a quarter at a time to to deal with but then um so you would you would cut your pieces out and then you would put them all on here so then you had this little strip of gold going around then she gave you the pattern for each of these blue that you could then cover with paper and lay it right on top of it. and it fits so good I mean it was really what I thought was going to be probably the most difficult part of the quilt was not difficult at all to do. So uh, I think sometimes we might look at quilts and say, oh, I could never do that. But if you just take it step by step and follow instructions, it usually comes together pretty easy. Somebody's already worked out all the problems. That's very true. <laughs> so you didn't do the blue first, Teresa? The blue. No, I did the gold first. Oh, well, the gold, the blue is on the blue is when I covered this part for the applique, the gold, it was only with about a, um, I'm trying to remember if she had me cut it bias or not, but it was just a small strip, like maybe two, an inch and a half that you covered all that with, and then you applique it down, and then you came back with that blue and applique that on top of it. It was. I, um, see, I would think that the gold was covering the blue, so the raw edges was covered by the um the gold but that's interesting to know her technique but Teresa you said something very important and I know Miss Rona as a pattern designer you said read the instructions and it all works <laughs> you have a tendency to not read they look at the visuals in the pattern and they want to know why something doesn't work we yeah uh, Nancy McNally talked a little bit about that at Gill meeting last night she said she has some of her testers that they don't want written instructions. They just want pictures. And I'm, I'm bad about that too, but I have learned, I have got to sit there. And if I don't read the whole book, but I'm going to at least read the section I'm going to be working on real closely and kind of make some notes. And that way it, it saves a lot of ripping out when you do it. <laughs> I've found, I th we were talking about, I forget who I was talking with, but we were talking about this, the same subject. And, and it was, um, that the longer you've been quilting, the less you read patterns, because uh, especially like when you're talking about traditionally pieced patterns and things like that, you you know how you make the block. So you don't you don't actually read it. You just see, oh, that's going to be, you know, half square triangle or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you've made a thousand of those. So you just go ahead and make it your own way. But then when you go back and read the pattern, oh, wait, they did it a different way for a specific reason because of how it's going to fit later on in the pattern, then, then you have to rip it out. And it's um, so, yes, yeah, I tell everybody, always read the pattern, whether it's an amazing quilt like the one you have there, Teresa, that has all kinds of different intricate things, or even if it's just something that looks fairly simple and straightforward, definitely read the directions because, and I, even I'm bad about that. <laughs> I will admit, <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Me yeah. too. Me too. For sure. Um, Teresa. So I would be so giddy if I was working on this. I would probably skip around and work, but do you work like all of those diamond triangles or whatever you were saying that was mm -hmm. your main focus fabric? Do you do all those at once? And then you do, I mean, like, or did you play around? Because I would want to skip from flower to bird. To... Well, I will admit I did make this these English paper piece, pieces first. I was just so, in, I just loved the fabric and I was anxious to make those. 
But then I set that aside and I went back and I went back to step one, where which was doing this center and and um but now see what I did do is like this flower right here is repeated here, 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 and here, and it's also repeated up here and here and um, here. I did make those flowers all at the same time. Oh, okay. And then I, and then I would do now this this block has some flowers that aren't anywhere else in the quilt, but like these are repeated also. And I would just go ahead and and at least prep them. I couldn't actually finish like this because it had the stem and the leaves, but I would prep the pieces so that when I got to that, I would I'd be ready to do the stem and then just put it on there. And then I would make all four of those at the same time. And for so, organizing, how did you organize those? Just for those out there that may be lacking some organizational skills for a project like this. Well, <laughs> the applique, I, I should have brought all that packet in here. I had little baggies for each flower. And in that baggie was all the petal pieces or the applique pieces that went to that flower. And like when I, when I did these, like these right here, I knew I was going to have to do them again up here. So I went ahead and cut the pieces for all those appliques. So the baggies for these flowers already were had the pieces in there. And sometimes I even had them covered already. And um, I just I just try to keep everything. Each flower had its own little baggie. The birds had their own little baggie. And that way I, and I had them labeled and, and how many I had to make of each and that sort of thing. So it just makes it simpler than... When you get to something, you think, oh, no, no, what do I need to do? How many do I need to cut? I already had all that labeled out, which makes it easier for me. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Rona, are you an organizer? When? Well, let me back up. It's a two-part question for you. I'm sure you're very organized when you're designing the quilt because you're getting ready to write the pattern. But if you're doing someone else's quilt, are you as organized or are you kind of... Uh, well, it depends on the project. So, um, like I said, I'm I I still find myself um not reading patterns all the way through like I should before I start. Um, but like Teresa said, I'll read a section and do that, and then read the next section and do that. If I'm making a bag, sometimes I jump around um more than I should, <laughs> especially the the biannies. I've I've definitely had to rip some of those out. Um, but um. I'm definitely very organized. And if there are a lot of fabrics um, in a quilt, like the one that I'm working on now, I, I definitely will label them. Like I use, um, I've used little bags, like Teresa said, with the, the labels. I've also used, um, I have this set of, they're giant paper clips and each paper clip has a letter on it, like A, B, C. So I've used those um, to keep them organized. But yeah, I... I'm I'm very uh, math brain, very linear. I I need to have it all organized. Otherwise, I just go crazy and I'll give up. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, Teresa, one of the things I don't think you said before when we were talking about the start, because we kind of started talking about fabric and then we we went off the rail of from start to finish. But as a reminder, um. I hear it in the shop sometimes. People will get a pattern and they will fail to do this very important step. Whether the pattern's in a book or it's an individual pattern or whatever, one of the first things you should do is go to the designer's website and look to see if there has been any update or corrections. Rona's shaking her head yes, yeah, so I'm going to let her finish that soapbox. Uh, yeah, I definitely, um, cause even as, as hard as we try, even though we have uh, people that test our patterns before we publish them, it's inevitable that eventually there's going to be a mistake that gets published. And so on our websites, we'll have, um, a, a specific page, like mine is a pattern correction page. Sometimes it'll be labeled an errata page, E-R-R-A-T-A, -A, um, and that just means that if there is a pattern that a correction has been made on, and maybe a bunch of patterns went out to quilt shops before we caught it, then you'll be able to find that correction and update your pattern that you purchased. So that way, you know, you don't 
find the error and then make a mistake and then get mad at us. And then it's a whole thing. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, and mess your fabric up, you know, you start right. cleaning before you look for those. And, and then you come to find out that there was a cutting error listed and maybe that fabric is out of print because you bought that fabric five years ago and you just now found the perfect pattern to go with it. So definitely help yourself out by going and looking to see if there's any corrections, even magazines. I know back in the day, it's been a while since I've looked, but the magazine companies would have a place where you could go to see if there was any corrections as well. Yeah, well um, that's true. That's very true. And, you know, I don't do that like I should. And I have had to rip things out and get really angry. And then I'll go and look. And sure enough, there was a correction that was, and I just hadn't checked it out. So that is very important. Mm -hmm. is, because I feel like in today's world of social media, people are so quick to be like, I haven't put a pattern out there. So I'll use me as an example. Lisa, she designed a crappy design, you know, pattern, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you're bad mouthing this designer unjust, right? If and a lot of times if you go to their page and there's not a correction on a particular pattern that you have chosen, but as you're reading it or something you're doing, you're not understanding, or you think there's E email they usually i'm sure you do rona don't you have a place where they can contact you and ask questions if they need to oh yeah yeah definitely on the website and and everything everywhere there's my email address and yeah if you if you ever find um what could be a correction on a pattern something doesn't make sense um you're confused about maybe some cutting instructions or even you know some something in there definitely email us whoever the pattern designer is because then we because if we don't know that a correction needs to be made, then we can't update the website. So, yeah, we definitely appreciate that when you let us know that, hey, this doesn't make sense or maybe this is, you know, a right. correction or. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Teresa, there was one other question I was going to ask you. Um Did she freeze or did she forget? I don't know. <laughs> well, my internet says I'm uh, unstable. That's probably true. <laughs> In more ways than one. Exactly what I was leaning towards, for sure. Um, so, Teresa, as you are putting a quilt of this caliber together, because this is not your normal quilter's quilt, right? Um, are you already, especially since you're a hand quilter, because we do have people that still hand quilt and others that are fascinated by it. Was you already kind of thinking as you were putting all this together, how you might hand quilt this or the design of quilting you were going to do? Actually, towards the end of it, I, I do think about it throughout the process of how I want to quilt it. But it just, um, this one was a problem for me because I couldn't, a lot of times when there's a center like this, I'll just either cross hatch it or I'll do straight lines. And I wanted to do this one differently. And so I thought I've got to come up with a different way to do that. But you've got so much applique, you want a good filler background to make that stand out good. So I'll, I'll show you the stencil I came up with. Um, yeah, because you definitely don't want the quilting to take away from all that beautiful work. Yeah, that's the stencil I used. Um, and I thought, well, this is hexagons. I like this. And so I was going to use it behind that center block and then all the flowery blocks. But I, um, the problem was I didn't want to do it in these blocks. Uh -huh. These blocks. I did the, the the hexagon background here and in all of these. But what do I do with these? And I got to thinking with all of this applique and see the spacing at the top is different from the spacing here. 
because she has to spread them out more. So I had I had thought about taking and doing some special little thing around in here, but then it wouldn't fit here because it's a different size. So I did end up just doing like straight lines across there uh, for those two. And then when I got back over here to these blocks, they have the um, hexagon things. So it just kind of evolves as I'm doing it. And on this one also, I didn't know, um, I need to shrink it back down so I can move it. Hmm. These, these sashings are smaller than the these over off. here. Mm, so yeah. I could use the same kind of border print for these that I would use for these. And I was really confused there how to quilt that. And I finally thought... Um, Wait a minute, yeah, let me get the other picture up. Maybe it'll make more sense. Oh, that's Pippery. That's wrong. One, two. Um, here it is. So it it dawned on me, and this is something else people can think about when they're quilting. Is I looked up Katrina Hadge Michael's quilt to see how she did this. Mm -hmm. And Hers was custom quilted, but I noticed that the quilter put just the straight lines. Like I have lines going down here and here and around each of these. And it really kind of looks nice on the other side because it looks like a picture frame around them. Uh -huh. And that was her solution. And so that was the solution I used. I took her idea. And sometimes you have to do that. You just can't come up with what you want to, how you want to quilt it. And so you look at the pattern and see how they quilted it and get ideas from there. Yeah, let the space talk to you. Teresa, I don't think I noticed. I got everybody, I got to see this in person literally as soon as she brought it out of the dryer. Yes. Um, she ran up to the shop and let me see it. And I was almost in tears because um, we'll talk about how long her process was in a minute. But Teresa, I think I was so taken back by everything. I did not realize until now in the picture that you quilted hexagons also in the back of each one of those flowers, like you did the center medallion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the texture yeah, on that, yeah. guys, is amazing, by the way, in person. So can I ask about the thread? Because I know, like, for, for my quilts, which are traditionally pieced generally, um, we always go back and forth about what color thread to use. So, and for mm -hmm. those, especially those beautiful bright colors um, and all the different applique, what color threads do you use for doing the, the quilting? There's my thread. <laughs> <laughs> and I just realized there's one spool that's not in there. It was a spool of orange. Um, I wanted to quilt around the applique in a thread color that matched the applique. I've never done that before. And I thought that would be kind of fun to do. And so it, it took, um, I had the gold and the green and the red and the pink and these colors here. And the, um, there was also some orange that I think was Orphil. I think my purple that I used was Orphil also. The problem is they don't make hand quilting thread in all these colors. Usually you find your 40 weight hand quilting thread in white, off-white black and a gray sometimes a, a blue and sometimes red but they just don't have a good good source for that i was very fortunate this spool right here is yli hand quilting thread and i was contacted by the uh, the new owner of that company and he uh asked me if i would be interested in testing when they're their new source for hand quilting thread so they sent me that big spool of it and man that is great hand quilting thread it's a 40 weight and it just glides through the fabric and it's just great but on all the other colors i couldn't find hand quilting thread so i used 30 weight um in some cases these were machine quilting threads and these were but these the ore fields and this green, they were just regular 30 weight thread or maybe even 25 weight. Um, hand quilting thread is normally 40 weight. And that was okay with me because I wanted the, I didn't want this background to stand out a lot, but I did want the, the colors I quilted around the applique. The problem I had with this 
was that machine thread is not meant to be taken through fabric and dragged through it over and over and over again. You know, it goes down and the bobbin catches it and it comes back up. So it's basically just going through that fabric once or twice. Mm -hmm. Hand quilting thread, you drag it constantly through the, the backing and the batting and all that. So my machine quilting thread kept fraying on me and breaking and I had to use a uh, thread treatment. Yes, I, I used a silicon, the it used to be called Thread Haven. I can never remember what they call it now, but are either beeswax. I prefer the silicone treatment on it. But I and I could also only tear off a piece about 18, maybe 20 yeah. inches long. Whereas with the hand quilting thread, you get a long piece because you're going to do a long waist. So I, I did find I had to treat the machine thread very differently than I treat hand quilting thread. But it worked. Yeah. I would do it again, even though it frustrated me at times. But I would do it again because I just like it. It looks pretty. I like the colors. So, and what type of since we're talking that this was hand quilted, what type of batting do you prefer, Teresa, when you are hand quilting, uh, to make it a little more ease for the hand sewer? You know, I used to use warm and natural all the time, but now when I'm gonna, uh, when I've got a big quilt like this, I send it to a long armor to baste for me. So I don't have to base it together. And usually I just let them use whatever batting they've got. Um, this um, this quilt was done in a 100% cotton batting, which it is a little bit nubbier. And sometimes the nubbiness pulls through, you know, rather than the like the 80-20. But it right. did okay. But it's, you know, it's a lot lighter weight. And once I wash the quilt, it's a lot softer than sometimes. But I, let me show you how I quilted that back. I try to get good pictures of this, but I'm not a very good photographer. But like this is a flower on the back. And as you can see, the colors of the that the match the applique. There's nothing like a hand quilted quilt. When uh, Teresa brought this in the shop and Steve came back, the first thing he'd done as soon as he touched it, this look came across his face. And I know that look because I've had it too. It takes me back to my grandmother's quilts. Mm -hmm. It's just a yeah. a warm feeling. Yeah. And this this is something I haven't ever seen another quilter use was the color of the thread to match the applique. And I love looking at the back of my quilt now because it's, it's like it's got colored drawings all over, you know. I uh -huh. um, did one more little red bird. You can oh, see yeah. the the green. I'm going to show you how it looks on the front. Here's I quilted very close to the applique rather than like a quarter inch out. I want it right on. So the colors are there, but they're not, you know, really noticeable as much. I didn't. I just wanted them to highlight it. I didn't want them to to take it and over. So. Notice the fussy cutting there, everybody, when she did <laughs> Fussy cutting is fun, yeah. It definitely um, is. So, Teresa, I cannot believe we're only eight minutes before our hour is up, and I don't want this information to not be said. For this particular quilt, a um, couple questions. One, tell everybody how you stay on task and a project of this caliber doesn't take five years and get lost. And then two, uh, just so they can hear the amazingness of it, I know you calculated your hours of hand quilting. So talk about how to stay on task and then also just for the awe of it all, the hours. Well, you, you know, I don't really have as much trouble staying on task because I just didn't enjoy the process and I want to, you know, I want to keep working on it. Um, for the quilting part of it, though, I had a an issue with one of my hands a couple of years ago, and the neurologist told me I could not quilt more than two hours at a time, and then I had to rest my hand. Where I was quilting four and six hours, I, I stab quilt rather than the rocking method, and it's, it's not as hard on your hands. So I would get up every morning and fix my coffee, and I would quilt for two hours. It took me 
259 hours to quilt this quilt. <laughs> but um, but it actually, I started in May and I finished quilting it. Um, let's see, this is what, September? September. So it's really not that long now. Making the quilt probably took me a year to do. But I made a bunch of other things during that same period of time. So Absolutely. I think you just you just have to really want to do it. You know, it has to. This gets back to is it stressful or is it enjoyable? And I enjoyed doing it. So I didn't have a problem staying on tasks. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's beautiful. It is. I just, beautiful. I just have to say real quick that I am just in awe of you, Teresa, and people that do quilts like that. And it's, and even like the Judy Niemeyer quilts and, and things like that, because I have a slight ADD issue. If you've ever spent any time with me, you'll, you'll learn that pretty quickly. Um, and so I, I, I have tried to sit and do handwork and I just, I can't focus on it. I'll work on it for a little bit. And then my brain goes and I set it down. And so I just, I, I I'm just in awe of of quilts like that and how you can stay focused like that. Well, when I'm doing a lot of times when I'm doing handwork, I'm also listening to an audible book, and I enjoy that, and that kind of helps. I'm not having to. I'm not trying to watch TV, which would be distracting me. I'm just listening, either that yeah. or music, and then I just quilt, and that's and that's that helps a lot with staying focused. Um, I feel like if I am so lucky to do one of these amazing type quilts in my retirement, I am going to be lucky. And I may be like, yeah, I don't want to do another one. But we all know that Teresa has done numerous like this and she literally just finished this. And Teresa, tell everybody what you told me the day that you brought this to the shop. <laughs> I already started another one. Um <laughs> While I'm quilting on this one for my two hours every morning, I'd go and start looking for fabrics and another one to do. And so I've started another quilt now, and I'm enjoying it. It's the Meryton. Do you, you like to see that one? Yes, we would love to see that. And then once we mm -hmm. look at this, guys, we're going to let Rona talk about whatever's going on in Rona world. You all yeah. already know in my world, I am in Utah at Handy Quilter, and that's why I'm etch a sketch on this internet tonight. But I'm glad I was able to be here. This is the one I'm working on now. Jeez. And um, this is all hexes. And then you're supposed to applique it to this big band. But I'm, I decided I'm going to do hexagons all the way there. And then um, just to, to say, you know, we're talking, what I have already done on this is I have already cut out all the applique templates for all these blocks and have them in little baggies. And so I know what I'm going to be doing. And I enjoy that. You know, that's part of the process to me that I enjoy doing. I'll show you how much of it I have done so far. As I was going to say, do we get a sneak peek at the fabric colors on this? Well, let me show you this one. This is, I was doing this center star. So I noted all what colors I needed and then I had the little box out here say what goes in those colors. The fabric line I'm using is Songbird Serenade which is really pretty. So that's one of my that was one of my first worksheets. This is Katrina's block here and then I was just noting what colors I was going to use. And so um, here is what I have completed to date. This one. Mama. Um, two of my friends are making this same quilt with me while, while they're doing theirs. And so we kind of try to get together about every week or every other week and catch up with each other and see how we're doing. And and, and it, that keeps us focused a little bit, too. And it makes it fun. So I was definitely going to say team uh, team accountability when you yeah. are doing those projects really does help for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Tracy. I didn't I didn't take a picture of my fabric swatch page on that one. I thought I'd show it to you, but I didn't take a picture. So I love it. I love it. Thank you for sharing this quilt journey of yours with us tonight. Um Rona. Well, keep on talking if you want. I love stuff. 
Well, I have one question that I, I want to ask just because I'm, I'm curious because everybody has a different answer. So, Teresa, out of all the steps involved that we've covered tonight in everything from the pattern to the fabrics to the quilt or piecing to the quilting, what is your favorite step in the process, in the journey? Actually, it's the planning. I love to get a new pattern and plan it and buy my fabrics and prep the materials. Yeah, that's what and I like the least hemming the binding down. <laughs> My least favorite. I knew she was going to say the organizational part because for mm -hmm. as long as I've been blessed to have Teresa as a quilty friend and past a quilty friend now, but from the beginning, I met her through quilting. Um, anytime Teresa would get ready to start a new uh, project, she is like a two-year-old at Christmas. She is <laughs> so giddy. And, oh, my gosh, her organizational stuff is hilarious. Yeah, I talk to people crazy <laughs> talking about what I'm going to do and getting it set more, up and everything. Oh, did I break out? Uh, yes. Which got more in-depth into quilting. Is it unstable? Well, that's a given, but you did freeze again. <laughs> okay. So anyway, Teresa was saying in the beginning that when she got back into quilting heavily, uh, she didn't really have quilty friends, so she started this little quilty group, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I know for a fact, uh, many years ago, I was not around, but I know the person that this story is about. So one of Teresa's really good friends, Donna Casson, did not quilt. <laughs> so Teresa did not go out and necessarily just recruit quilters for her group. She drug her friend in and said, you're going to learn to quilt. True story. <laughs> That's I how had I started to to that first meeting, bringing in old machines that there had been their mother's machine or something. They didn't know how to thread it. And, and all so, but I will say some of those ladies, are, Donna is a long arm quilter now. She teaches other people how to quilt and they've all gone on to make beautiful quilts and, and thanked me many times for <laughs> making them learn. Absolutely. Well, that's my point. You know, when you love a hobby and you may not know other like-minded people, definitely talk about it to your friends and you guys can create your own little sewing bee group, if you will. And um, these ladies, it makes me want to cry. These ladies were so nice to me during the pandemic and allowed me to Zoom uh, stitch with them over English paper piecing and... Um, it's just amazing. It is just amazing the friendships that you will create and how you become so close, so close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that whole unexpected happiness in every stitch, right? Like mm -hmm. that works. I feel um, like I've heard that somewhere before. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, before Rona tells us what's going on in her world, I do want to give opportunity. Uh, you always know that Steve is the man behind the curtain, just like in The Wizard of Oz. So, Steve, you've seen Teresa's quilt in person. I didn't know if you wanted to chime in, if there was something that we neglected to talk about that you wanted the viewers to hear. Uh, simply that you cannot capture how beautiful these quilts are, especially this one Teresa's showing right now behind her, um, without seeing it in person. It is absolutely amazing. And uh, you know, Teresa is a true artist, um, and uh, you you actually, there were several things I learned tonight that I didn't know when you were talking about the uh, hand sewing and the thread choices versus machine threads, and I, I didn't understand the reasons for that, um, and that just made so much sense, but I also did not know the planning part was your favorite part, um, and it made so much more sense now. Um, because you do come in and you are so much more joyful um, than most <laughs> other folks are at that planning stage. Some people find that really, really frustrating, you know, and they That's want true. help and they've got tons of questions. And I, I had noticed that, but I really hadn't put it together. Um, and I don't know, it's just, it is such a joy to watch you when you do come in and you're planning your, your next quilt. And uh, it's great being part of that. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Miss Rona, 
We've got actually one minute, but you can take more. Tell everybody what's going on in Rona, the Riveters world. Uh, so just real quick, um, I, I got home. I'm actually home for more than a couple weeks now um, and because it's winter time. So the only thing I have left is, is market. But um, I had an amazing time at the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show. It was fantastic. They beat records as far as how many people came to the show. And um, it was my last time vending. And I had lots of vendor friends that came over and hugged me and and lots, uh, lots of our people out there in, in social media land. I got to say hi to and meet in person. And and it was it was amazing. And that meant the world to me. And um, yeah, so then I'm home now working on some projects. Um, I can show you actually one because it's not a pattern. It's something I'm working on for my kids. I'm shooting for Christmas 2026, but we'll see if it gets done <laughs> before then. So, it, but you guys can see this is what it is. And I'm I'm calling it, what did I call it? Starry Waterfalls. <laughs> So this was something that I worked up on EQ that I'm electric quilt that I'm working on for the kids. And then, um, so work wise, um, next up is market. I'll be at quilt market and festival. And as it turns out, I was only going to be there one day, but now I will be there for the entire festival, but I can't tell you why yet, but it's coming. Um, and, um, let's pause. see, what else can I tell you? <laughs> pause, pause on that market. Um, oh. guys, next month, we're always normally the third Tuesday of the month yes. with Quilt Babble Live. Uh, Rona and I had a little discussion. Well, I should say Rona and I and Steve had a little discussion that it would be really cool if we went live at Quilt Market. So with that being said, we don't know the date yet of the Zoom because we oh, are going to have, I know. So for October, we're going, obviously me and yeah, so Lisa and Rona, we're going to be live at market. <laughs> we'll find a time probably during the day so that we can set up and, and be live for market because we want you guys to see kind of what market's like, right? And maybe we can find some people, some vendor and pattern designer friends and fabric friends to come and come on and maybe we'll just have a smorgasbord. We'll set up a table in the middle of the room and have whoever comes by <laughs> sit down. That's I think so that's good. Good. I, like it. I, like it. I, know. I don't know if we'll be I've always I'll wanted to go to market. I never got to. So this is great. I'm glad y'all are going to do it. Yeah, we'll just be like, we'll we'll channel our inner, inner Yasmita from Yazzie Bags, which are amazing, by the way. And and we will just bring our own table and set it up and just say, this is what we're doing. <laughs> Hopefully we don't get kicked out. But if we do, I don't know about you, Rona, but I've been kicked out of better. Oh, well, that's true. <laughs> That is true. But yeah, so so yeah, I'll be at, at market and festival. And of course, Rice Arona, hashtag Rice Arona, because first day of, of festival is Halloween. We will be in costume and we will be going live uh, various. So there's going to be lots of lots of online stuff to, to see and, and follow around market and Houston, both here with Lisa on Facebook and then uh, with me on Instagram and all of that. So yeah. So guys, definitely keep paying attention on social media to find exactly what date and time we are going to go live for Quilt Babble Live. Um, but like Rona said, it probably will be during the day, not that 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, just because of different people's schedule. And plus, I think you guys want to see what's going on on the floor. Yeah, because all the brand new stuff comes out at market, like all the new new notions and fabrics and goodies. And oh, I'm excited. I haven't been to market since 2019. So I'm very excited. <laughs> I don't know what we should do. Like, actually, we need to go live about once a day on Quilt Babble Live over there. But you should, be on, you should be on your phone live while I'm on my phone live. And obviously we're in Zoom and you'd be on one end of the floor and I'm on the other. And we just go to booth like and so, and I'll be like, Rona, look at this. And then while I'm finding my next booth, you're in a booth saying, hey, look at this. Hey, we could do that. And then that won't upset Steve with our voice reverberation because <laughs> we'll be on opposite sides of the building. He will not be able to watch us when we are moving around. He will be like his vertigo will throw him over the edge.
Guys, we are so sorry we went over time tonight, but it is episode one of season three. And as you can tell, Rona and I are extremely excited. Teresa, once again, thank you so much for being here on this monumental episode. Thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed it. I'm sure you'll be back. I'm sure you'll be back. <laughs> Guys, have a good night, and we will see you soon right here on Quilt Babble Live with Lisa and Rona. Good night. Bye-bye.